Some people think they can find happiness through their children. Since they can't personally achieve certain things, they hope that through their children they will achieve these things. But again, children oftentimes put stress in people's lives. You know, you have to raise the kids and the problems that come with raising those kids because they don't do what you feel they should have done. So, happiness, we can't find it there. Money, income, money. Well, according to the media, money should be what can buy for us happiness. The happiest people, the person who has the yacht, they can go off to the West Indies or to seashells and just you know live that nice, comfortable, luxurious life. Well, what happened to that couple that went from the UK, right? Retired couple, they got their yacht, they're circling around the world. Somali pilot pirates got them. <laughs> you know, that happy, happy life <laughs> got hijacked. <laughs> so, even where you think money can do it for you, you get hijacked. Money doesn't necessarily do it. Dr. Abu Amina Belal Phillips. His quest to search for the truth led him from the, uh, his birthplace uh, in Jamaica to the streets of Toronto in Canada where he grew up and accepted Islam in 1972. That journey has left him right down uh, many paths and he's obviously now to Islamic scholarship lectureship, authorship, and a thinker. Bilal Phillips Abu Amina completed his BA from the College of Islamic Disciplines, Asul Uddin, at the Islamic University of Medina in 1979. Thereafter, thereafter he went on to complete his Masters in Aqidah in the University of Riyadh in 1985. He finally obtained his PhD in the University of Wales. Far cry from Medina, subhanAllah. In the UK, well, in Islamic theology in 1994, he taught Islamic education in Arabic in private schools, lectured in M.Ed. Uh, uh, students in the Islamic uh, studies department in various universities. He's founded Islamic information centers while traveling extensively across the globe, imparting Islamic knowledge as dictated by the Islamic tradition. Apparently he likes, he enjoys to play squash, and that's what he does to keep fit. Teaches his children also to do martial arts, of which, uh, be careful, because he's a black belt. Well, he's a black belt, very accomplished man, you know, alhamdulillah. I think what he considers, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later on, to be uh, something which is, uh, he's very happy about is... He founded an Islamic online university which has over 20,000 students worldwide. And we're going to be talking about that. He's authored, authored uh, over 100 Islamic books, including uh, the books we see outside, The Fundamentals of Tawheed, which is his own favorite, apparently. He currently resides in Doha, and he's, uh, in the summer of 2009, established a Preston International College and Fajr International Schools in Chennai, in Chennai, in India. Needless to say, I can go on and the list uh, of his achievements, to be honest, is quite extraordinary for, you know, one single man in this day and age, in this, in this age of global, international 
capitalism. And tonight he's going to address us and address all of us, whether we are Muslim or non-Muslim, on the way to real happiness. The title is now The Way to Real Happiness. So, if brothers and sisters, you'd like to please sit down uh, so that we can welcome the Sheikh. So please sit down, everybody. Calm down, sit down, get your places. I know there's lots of people in the room. Okay, so everybody sitting down now. So now I think we're going to welcome to the stage for the last lecture in this uh, peace conference today. Of course, we'll be here tomorrow as well. The Way to Real Happiness by Dr. Abu Amina Belal Phillips. Please come to the stage now. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. The topic, the way to real happiness, is one which concerns all people. Happiness, first and foremost, is a contented state of mind where a person feels peace, inner peace, even in a state of difficulty or even in a state of torture. A person may be happy to sacrifice himself under circumstances that would make most people unhappy. So it is really a state of mind. And all people strive for it, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of their positions in life. What we find is that people try to find that state commonly today through drugs trying to achieve that state of happiness, feeling contented, feeling pleasurable, because they are associating happiness with pleasure. But reality is that people who take drugs end up miserable. It provides a temporary release or a temporary state of pleasure, but that pleasure doesn't last it quickly goes away. And to be able to fund it, it requires a lot of money. It leads people into all kinds of crime. And those people who have a lot of money, what do they end up doing? Eventually overdosing. Because you can only take so much of it and it's going to overcome you. Regardless, drugs does not provide happiness. Also, people try to find happiness through music. Music is a, a, a means of people being emotionally motivated. When you're down, you play your favorite song, it makes you feel up. But you can only play your favorite song so much. Eventually, you have to get on with life. You can't stay in your room playing your favorite song over and over again. So, music doesn't do it either. Because were music truly the source of happiness, then musicians should be among the happiest people in the world. But what we find is that musicians get involved in drugs because they're not getting the happiness through the music, so they're looking for it through the drugs, and the drugs end up in overdoses and all these kind of things. So it isn't in music, though it seems to be at the time. Also, some people, find or think they can find happiness through sex, sexual relations. But were that the source of happiness, then the prostitutes should be the happiest people in the world. But again, we find that prostitutes are not the happiest people in the world. They're complaining, they're, you know, it's not a happy life. So it's not there either. Other people seek it through material, 
uh, items or products or possessions, the car, the ultimate, Maserati, Ferrari. But we hear of so many people with these cars killing themselves, committing suicide. It's not there either. Or a home. You buy the biggest home you can. Still, those people with the huge homes, castles, palaces. What happened with Princess Diana? Didn't she have the castle? The ultimate home? Did she find happiness? No. Or in children. Some people think they can find happiness through their children. Since they can't personally achieve certain things, they hope that through their children they will achieve these things. But again, children oftentimes put stress in people's lives. You know, you have to raise the kids and the problems that come with raising those kids because they don't do what you feel they should have done. So, happiness, we can't find it there. Money, income, money. Well, according to the media, money should be what can buy for us happiness. The happiest people, the person who has the yacht, they can go off to the West Indies or to seashells and just you know, live that nice, comfortable, luxurious life. Well, what happened to that couple that went from the UK, right? Retired couple, they got their yacht, they're circling around the world. Somali pilot pirates got them. <laughs> you know, that happy, happy life <laughs> got hijacked. <laughs> so even where you think money can do it for you, you get hijacked. Money doesn't necessarily do it. So sports, people sometimes they focus on the emotions that they're built up in sports, you know, your favorite team, you know, cheering for them, you feel hyped up, you feel that euphoria when your team wins, but the team doesn't always win. There are times when the team loses, and you feel down, you feel bad, you're crying, and all these other So, it's not there in sports either. So, where is it? Where? will one actually find happiness, true happiness? Well, Stephen Covey identified a principle which if a person could live it, it would in fact represent a state of happiness. He called it the win-win situation. Where you're winning on both sides. It's not a win-loss. You don't view life from a win-loss perspective. <laughs> If I win, he loses. If he wins, I lose. No. If he wins, I win. If I win, he can win too. So where one looks at things in a positive life, a light all the time, that could in fact create a state of happiness. But reality is that people don't function like that unless there are other factors to motivate them. We do see people's success when it's at our own expense as their success and our failure. Very difficult to find the positive side. Unless there are some higher principles that can guide us. And 1,400 years ago, in Arabia, a man by the name of Suhaib ibn Sinan, who was a disciple or follower of Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, he quoted the Prophet as saying, the affair of the believer is amazing. The whole of his life or her life is beneficial. And that is only in the case of the true believer. When good times comes to him or her, he or she is grateful. And it is good for him or her. 
And when bad times befall him or her, he or she is patient and it is good for him or her. And this is only in the case of the true believer. In this statement of the prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, the last prophet of God. He identified three principles for true happiness. The first was faith. The second, gratitude. And the third, patience. Three principles. Faith, gratitude, and patience. Meaning that gratitude and patience without faith, it's not going to work. You may be happy for part of the time, but without faith, you can't keep it up. In terms of faith, modern research, Western researchers looking into different groups of people, analyzing their stress levels, because stress, which produces depression, is one of the major diseases of our times. According to recent statistics, more than 20 million adults suffer from depression yearly in the US alone. I don't have the figures for here in Norway, but I'm sure percentage-wise it would be similar. In fact, the death rate due to suicide was double the rate of those who died from AIDS in 2000, the year 2000 in the US. The death rate for those who died from suicide, that is depression, stress, producing these acts, was double that of those who die from AIDS. But what we hear about is AIDS and the problem of AIDS, but depression is even more so. Also, more people die from suicide in America than actually die from homicide. Homicide where somebody kills you. There are more people who kill themselves than are being killed. And the crime rate in the US is very high. So what we're looking at when we talk about issues of stress, and depression is something very, very serious because obviously one cannot be happy in a state of stress and depression. It doesn't work. What they found was that religious people are happier and less stressed than non-religious people. In general, when they went across all of the various groups, they came up with the statistics. It showed that High religiousness predicts a lower risk of depression and drug abuse, fewer suicide attempts, and more reports of a sense of well-being. All of the various research that was done showed these same conclusions, that faith, practically speaking, produces a better sense of well-being among people than a lack of faith. If we look in terms of gratitude, we find, we were just looking at the research uh, products, what has come from modern research with regards to these points that the prophet mentioned 1,400 years ago. What they found is that People who were grateful, they had higher levels of well-being. They were happier, less depressed, less stressed, and more satisfied with their lives and social relationships. Grateful people also had higher levels of control of their environments. And that's really important because people who end up depressed, one of the big factors that lead people into depression is feeling a sense where you have no control over your environment. Your life is just running out of control. 
You're spiraling downwards. You can't stop it. So when you have this sense of control, that is going to alleviate stress. So such people have greater and higher levels of personal growth, sense of purpose and self-esteem. So it has been shown that that state of gratitude is something which is uniquely important, though in a lot of the psychological studies they don't put you know, very much stress on this at all, maybe it's not even mentioned, but modern research has shown that it has a major impact, even more so than what are known as the big five, and these are the big five factors which psychology teaches as the broad uh, personality uh, dimensions. They don't mention gratitude in it, but modern research shows different. And as a result of a new trend in psychology from the year 2000, where we had what came to be known as uh, positive psychology. There was a positive psychology movement. You know, gratitude became the mainstream focus of their research. Uh, this was a key figure. We find in the Quran where Allah states in the 14th chapter, verse 7, if you are grateful, I will give you more. If you are grateful, I will give you more. If you're grateful to God, grateful in your life, you will be blessed with more. And actually, uh, modern research has shown that it does have an impact on people, a very positive, motivational impact. Because they did some uh, studies in restaurants where the waiter would put on the check, thank you. Just write personally as a thank you after the person had paid the check. And they found that there was a 60% increase in customers coming back. They found in a jewelry store, they did a, a similar test in a jewelry store, where after people bought jewelry, went home, the store would call up the people or email them, if they gave their emails, and just thank them for having bought from their store. And they found a 70% increase in people coming back and buying from them. You know? So it's, this is something which is real on a spiritual level and it's real also on a material level. The third principle, that of patience, is something which psychology doesn't tackle as a characteristic, but it really looks at it really as a uh, issue of decision making, you know, whether you're patient uh, in making a decision or you are hasty. They look at it from that perspective. And they have concluded, they concluded that human beings on the whole, if they look at the short-term benefit and the long-term benefits, they will be hasty and choose the short term. That's what's the norm. And of course it's mentioned in the Quran also where Allah said, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا That human beings are created in haste. That is a part of their nature. But still, we are encouraged to be patient. Great stress placed on patience. And some modern researchers have in fact suggested that it should be included in the character strengths and virtues system, it's called the CSV uh, program or CSV uh, system, as one of the key character strengths. 
course, the Quran stresses that it is critical because of the fact that our lives are lives filled with tests. Life doesn't move along a smooth pattern. There are ups and downs. That's the nature of life. It's going up and down for everybody. So what gets you through the ups and the downs? As Allah said in the second chapter, verse 155, I will certainly test you with fear, hunger, loss of wealth, lives, and fruits. So give glad tidings to those who are patient. And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had said, no one has been given a greater gift than patience. So patience is key. So we have these three basic principles. Faith, which modern research has proven, improves our state of well-being and gives us a better shot at being happy. Gratitude also, which motivates others to do good and also increases that person's self-esteem, sense of uh, self-worth. Life has a purpose. And patience, critical to deal with the stressful circumstances of life. Because without patience, there's no way to handle it. So, the question then is, how do we develop these? How does one develop faith, gratitude, and patience if we are to achieve this? First and foremost, faith from the Islamic technical perspective consists of belief in the heart, a belief which is stated on the tongue, one expresses that belief and is, a, is acted upon by the limbs, so it's translated into action. It is not just a concept, but a concept in action. It begins with knowledge. As God said in the Quran, 47th chapter, verse 19, not know that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. This a person has to know. This is the beginning of faith. To know, to have knowledge that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. Meaning that without that knowledge, one may have faith based on worshipping other than God. Worshipping animals, trees. These are all levels of faith. And these levels of faith, even though they may be wrong, they may still have a positive impact on the person. But it won't have the full impact. Unless that faith is the correct faith. That correct faith begins with knowing that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. Of course, that raises another question as to what is worship. It is also knowing that worship from the Islamic perspective is not merely going to a mosque and praying. That is an aspect of worship. But in fact, we have the whole concept of worship described in another verse in the Quran wherein Allah said or told the Prophet to state to people, say, indeed my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. Meaning that living a life in which one seeks to do what is pleasing to God, this is true worship. That worship covers all aspects of life. It's not limited to prayer or limited to beseeching God in times of difficulty. Everybody can do that. 
Anybody can do that. Prayer involves living the whole of one's life. From the time one gets up in the morning to the time one goes to sleep at night. Doing what is in fact pleasing to God. And of course, that requires knowledge. And for the increase of faith, because that's the question, people say, well, okay, I believe that, I want to try to do that, but my faith seems to be low. How do I increase that faith? Well, there's a very simple formula which increases faith. And that is that faith increases by doing acts of obedience, good deeds. And it decreases by committing sins. Very simple formula. Doesn't require a lot of psychological, you know, uh, psychiatric delvings. It is clear. You do sins, your faith goes down. You do good deeds, righteous deeds, your faith goes up. In fact, so those people who are involved in uh, psychological programs to help people under stress, one of the things they tell them to do is go out and do a good deed. They tell them, go out, whatever you consider to be a good deed, think what is a good deed, and then go out and do it. And they found, really, that people when they went out and did good deeds, they came back with a higher sense of uh, happiness or contentment in their lives. Many experiments were done with students and this consistently came out in the results. Secondly, gratitude. Gratitude, which is thankfulness or appreciation. It is a positive emotion or attitude in acknowledgement of a benefit that one has received or one will receive. It is a positive emotion. It is showing thankfulness when people have done things for us. This is something which can be learned. We learn it first and foremost by realizing that whatever good is in our lives ultimately comes from God. As is stated in the Quran in the 53rd verse of the 16th chapter, whatever blessings you have are from Allah. And in order to develop that human characteristic of gratitude, then it must be implemented, practiced among our fellow human beings. And that is why the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said, whoever doesn't thank people, doesn't thank Allah. That if we are to be thankful to God, it should be manifest in our being thankful to those people around us. Besides the fact that being thankful to them motivates them to want to do more good, with, at the same time, we have to recognize what good is done for us, even though we know it is ultimately coming from God. And in order to preserve our state of gratitude, the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, further advised us, do not look to those above you, but to those below you, as it is best for you to remember God's favor on you. Our nature is to always look at people who have more than we have and wish we had what they had. And what does that do? It makes you feel depressed. Why don't I have what he has? Sometimes it takes people to the point of, God, this is not fair. Why should he have that and I don't have it? Why was she born beautiful and I was born ugly? You know, comes down to that. It's not fair. There couldn't possibly be a God. What's the fairness in it? You know, where we start to look at others who in the material world seem to have more than us. So the Prophet said, don't do that. Don't look at those who seem to be better off than you are. Better to look at those who are worse off 
Because you can always find them. There are always people, no matter how bad your situation is, you can always find people worse off. So then what does that produce in you? A sense of gratitude. I say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I'm not in that situation. So that is what helps to preserve that sense of gratitude. With regards to the third characteristic, patience, and this is a tough one, so tough that when a man came to the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, and asked him, what do I need to do to get to paradise? He said to him, what? Don't get angry. That's all. Don't get angry. To have the patience, the control, where one stops oneself from exploding. And of course, this is talking about anger over things that it is not necessary to be angry over. Things that can be overlooked. Of course, one should be angered if one sees evil being done to others. You know, if one doesn't feel a sense of anger, this is wrong, and be upset about it, then of course there's something wrong with one's faith. But we're talking about general circumstances where somebody just uh, does something to you, it could be accidental, but you're exploding. You know, you're just a time bomb waiting to explode. Just take something, any little thing, pressing a button and there you are. So the Prophet ﷺ said to this individual, don't get angry. That patience would be enough to carry him to paradise. That's how important patience is. So how can we develop this characteristic? It's so important. And of course Allah refers to it as being the solution for the trials of life. Those are those who are blessed by Allah, those who have that sense of patience. They are the ones who are ultimately successful. So, how do we develop it? Some people just seem to be born patient. They're just naturally patient. Whereas the rest of us, we're struggling. How to be patient? Well, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, مَنْ يَتَصَبَّرْ يُسَبِّرْهُ Allah." That is, whoever pretends to be patient, Allah will grant him patience. Some people might say that's hypocrisy. What do you mean you're pretending to be patient? You know, you're exploding on the inside, but on the outside, you're patient. It's hypocrisy. You're not really patient. But the point is that this is the nature of how we can develop positive characteristics. That if we repeat this time and time again, eventually this will become a real characteristic. In the sense that we are able to put whatever is churning, burning inside to put that flame out. It comes eventually. It's like they say practice makes perfect. So you work on it. If the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, said that this is the best way, then know that it is the best way and it does work. Even though people might say, no, it's hypocrisy. No. It is a means because you're doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah because you're striving to achieve that level of patience. If you're just doing it to show off, of course, then it is hypocrisy. It doesn't really benefit you. But if you're doing it really striving to achieve that state of patience in your life, to make patience one of the, your, your normal characteristics, then it is something pleasing to God. And you will be granted patience. Also, being patient involves doing things consistently. Because patience is not just being able to hold oneself in times of trial. It's also patience in doing what should be done to, to patiently persevere, to endure circumstances and keep on at it. 
So patience is involved in doing good deeds consistently. It involves patience also. And the Prophet ﷺ advised that the good deed done consistently is most beloved to Allah, even if it is small. So that's what we should struggle for and strive for, is consistency. Better to do a little bit all the time, we establish it, then we can build on top of that. Then to jump in and do everything, but then, like the match, you light it, big flame, and then, and you're out. So better to be consistent. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about change in our lifestyle. To achieve these characteristics, whether it be faith, gratitude, or patience, then it involves us making significant changes in our course of life. And this is the challenge. The challenge which is before us tonight. We have to ask ourselves, why did we come here tonight? Did we really come here to benefit, to take something that we will leave which will change the course of our lives, to help us really find true happiness in our lives? Or did we come here to be entertained? You know, speakers can become like entertainers for people. People come to lectures, after lectures, after lectures, after lectures. They enjoy, they come, they feel entertained. Yeah, he was a funny speaker. He made me laugh, yes. But we come back to the next lecture and we're still the same way we were after the first lecture. And the third and the fourth and the fifth. No real change. Or we come to socialize. Socialize. We're looking at the reasons why people come to conferences and lectures. They come to socialize. Because we're leaving, uh, living scattered lives out there. This is a chance to come hang out you know, with the brothers or the sisters with the sisters. Or it's a question of peer pressure. You know, some brothers are coming, and they say, aren't you coming to the lecture? Oh, I really didn't feel like coming to the lecture, but okay, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Yeah. You feel the pressure of your, all your friends are going, you don't want to be not there. Or people come to lectures for what? For romance. Brothers get to see the sisters. <laughs> sisters get to see the brothers. This is some of the motivating factors. This is real. We're talking real talk here now. Right? Why people come here? Some people came, if you ask them tonight, why did they come? They say, we came to see BP. Who is BP? Bilal Phillips. <laughs> the mystery speaker. Some people came just to get a boost in their Iman. You know, they feel the Iman down, so okay, we come hang out with the, the believers, we get a boost, we get, leave here feeling a better Muslim. But the bottom line is that if we keep coming back to the lectures and to the conferences, the same way, in the same state we were from the previous, then we are engaging in what the psychologists call Obsessive behavior. Obsessive behavior, meaning what? You keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. This is called obsessive behavior. We also call it banging your head against the wall. The wall's not gonna break, it's your head. So we have to ask ourselves seriously, 
When are we going to make this change? Why shouldn't it be tonight? Why shouldn't we make tonight the beginning point? People say, well, no, change takes time. You know, it takes time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah, that's true. Rome wasn't built in a day. But change doesn't really take time. If you think about whatever changes you've done or we've done in our lives, for each instant where we have changed, you can see a specific time. The day before we were doing this thing, the day after we no longer did it. Or the day before we weren't doing this thing, the day after we started doing it. Change actually is instantaneous. What takes time is the decision to change. That's the one. Yeah, we can sit and think about it. Yeah, I'll think about it next week and after the next lecture and yeah, that can go on till we reach the grave. The decision to change. So what we need tonight for this lecture on the way to happiness, we've seen it's clear what needs to be done. We need to be committed to striving to establish real faith in our lives. Faith which is based on knowledge. Faith which is implemented in our actions. We have to become grateful people who are patient with the struggles of our lives. The question is, are we ready to do this from tonight? We've looked at the issues. We've looked at the way, the method. It's just about implementing that method. So what I want to ask of you tonight is for you to put up your hand. To show your commitment before God, before Allah, that you will try to implement this knowledge in your life and make that change tonight. How many people are ready to do it? This is what we'd like to see. Yeah. And this is something which is between you and Allah in the end. Because I'm not going to be here next time I'm invited here to give a talk and say, hey, I remember your hand was up. <laughs> I don't see any change in your life. No, I'm not going to be here to do that. This is between you and Allah. But this is what makes these types of conferences worth it. That we take something practical and we leave with it and use it to change and to benefit our lives. Otherwise, as I said, we're just wasting our time. And we will be asked about our time and how we spent it. Okay? Barakallah fikum. I ask Allah to bless all of you to make that commitment real. And to grant His mercy and his forgiveness for what has gone before. And that he bless us with guidance in our lives to really be on that path to paradise where the ultimate happiness lies. For those on that path are those who have also found happiness in this life. Amen. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بير. بير. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله خير في your patience and uh, it's really nice to see so many people here in Oslo in Norway it's the first time I've been to Oslo in Norway
Like I said, when I landed from the plane the other day, I thought I landed in paradise. When I woke up in the morning, I just saw this snow and this beautiful scenery outside the wood. I thought, alhamdulillah, I got there. But <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> I saw your ugly faces, right? But <laughs> never mind. <so. laughs> anyway, alhamdulillah, it's so good to see you all. Really, it's fantastic. Sorry about the jokes. It's beautiful to see all of you guys. No, really it is. It's so good. It's refreshing to see all of you guys. I mean, we're in Scandinavia. Subhanallah. And I hope you appreciated Dr. Bilal Phillips' talk. If you want to, um, you know, there are some copies of that book. It's a slightly different uh, uh, title, The Search for Inner Peace, which we do have. So if some of the not yet Muslims want to read that more thoroughly, and as understand the, the, the whole argument with the doctor, doctor's talk, they can get that outside, inshallah. So we'll move swiftly over to the, uh, the next, the last phase of um, the second day, which is the question and answer sessions pertaining to the topic. Um, before we move into the questions, and of course you know the rules about the questions, so you can start Come, you know, thinking about your questions, or if you've already got the questions, particularly not yet Muslims, brothers over here, sisters over there, okay? You can um, start thinking about your questions or compose yourself. You can start standing up near the mics and just try to say who you are, you know, where you're from, what your profession is, how many children you've got, you know. <laughs> That's all. But, be prepared. Okay. Before we do that, before anyone leaves, we've got some uh, new good news. Some more good news, alhamdulillah. So, um, we'll firstly uh, ask the, my brother, Norwegian brother, to attend. He knows what is happening next to take shahada. Norwegian brother? Okay. Please come up. I'm more, I'm more nervous than you are. No, it's not right about it. Simple. But you've studied about Islam. You clear about the main message of Islam. So you feel you have enough background to commit yourself? You know, it's, it's one step forward, the next step is one step forward, right? And you want to be serious about it. Okay. Anyway, uh, your name is? Besart. Huh? Besart. Besart? Okay, we have uh, with us Brother Besart, who has been doing some reading about Islam, and uh, he has concluded that he wants to join the faith. And that, um, of course, it's the first step in the journey which involves much more study and, and understanding. And um, he is joining, of course, with that, with this step, the whole brotherhood of Islam. And uh, he has now uh, become a member, you know, me being first among them, relative to yourself, you know, your brother in Islam. So, of course, uh, whatever uh, help we can provide for you, any issues or questions that you have, you know, that you would come back to us. Huh? Yeah. So to become a Muslim, of course, very simple. You just have to repeat after me. I will say it first in English, and then we can say it in Arabic afterwards. Okay? Yeah. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God. That is no God worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that Muhammad. That Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah. Is the last me messenger of Allah. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Barakallahu <laughs> fikum.
So whilst all the uh, excitement is going on down here, we've um, now the brothers, like I said, he's never been hugged by another man in his life. <laughs> he's got another thing coming. <laughs> so they mean well, bro. Um, so I'd just like to also, you know, whilst this don't want to distract you guys from this beautiful scene that's going on down here. There are some sisters who also want to take Shahada in the balcony. So I understand that we, we want to get there's two sisters. Allahu Akbar. So So if they can come down uh, to the microphone over here. There was some uh, brother that came to me yesterday and he said there are not enough Norwegian sisters, Muslim sisters, so I have to marry Ahli Kitab. It's happening, brothers. <laughs> no excuses now. Huh? Alhamdulillah. So, Sheikh Fadl. Okay, sisters, uh, can you say your names, please? Uh, Mr. Husseini. And the other sister? Sarah. Sarah. Okay, um, you've both studied about Islam for some time. Yes. Yes. Huh? And um, nobody is forcing you to accept Islam. No. Okay. Um, of course, uh, I won't go into details about exactly why you're choosing to accept Islam. I just assume that you have enough knowledge about it to make this step. Huh? So, as you saw before, to become Muslim now, you just have to repeat after me. You can both do it at the same time, okay. together. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God. That there is no God worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. But Allah. But Allah. And I bear witness. And I bear witness that Muhammad. That Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah. Is the last messenger of Allah. In Arabic, Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Welcome to Islam, sisters. Subhanallah. Uh, right. You want to ask if there's anybody else? Um, just in the time on honored fashion, then, brothers and sisters. Um, is there anybody else who wants to take shahada? I mean, you know, you've seen the other brothers and sisters in humanity. Yeah. khair. Very, very good point. The brother's saying we should look after the new Muslims. What, a, you know, we've got the same thing in England going on, and some of the statistics are pretty frightening about the number of people who come into the Deen of Islam, they don't get looked after, and they actually apostate. Yeah. Uh, I think um, there should be, for each of the sisters, there should be a sister amongst you there who commits herself mm. to follow up 
with his sister, mm -hmm. like the practice of the Prophet, may God's be, peace and blessing be upon him, when uh, Muslims came to Medina that he made a brotherhood pact with the people of Medina. Similarly, for our brother who has come in, is there somebody who is responsible? Yeah. Who will be his buddy? Mentor. Okay, so you will be following up with him and uh, whatever help, whatever he needs, then you channel mm -hmm. it back through the organizations that they can make sure yeah. to help him. Huh? So similarly, do we have two sisters that are responsible for these two sisters? Huh? That's one, two, okay. Three, even, good. MashaAllah. Zakhalaf uh, Sheikh Bilal, for that. And uh, just remind the, the, uh, the new Muslims, there are some new Muslim courses coming up with Hussein Yi. So all of you people who've accepted Islam and those people who've accepted Islam relatively recently or even as if it's years ago and you don't, don't know too much because maybe you haven't interacted with the right Muslims or read anything, well then it's up to you to come to those courses and then you can go to the stores at the back, you know, in the entrance for you and sign up for those courses and make sure that you engage and learn as much as possible about your new way, your new direction, inshallah, your newfound direction. Okay, so I take it from that, that that was just a question or an observation, look after the new Muslims. There's no other people who want to accept Islam. Upstairs, downstairs, okay? Well, if you do, you go to the uh, microphone here and here, and we, we can deal with that, inshallah. In the meantime, so we crack on or resume the question and answer session uh, for the Sheikh on the topic. So, do we have any questions from this, all that hullabaloo and the shahadas? You know, I think people are. Any brothers down there? One question over here. Okay, we'll start with the brother over here. If you come to the microphone, just mention who you are and what your profession is, and then question. I have a question from a non Muslim. Uh, how does he know that uh, inside or in the heart that Islam is the right uh, religion? If, is there any advice uh, if you have any doubts? Uh, the question, uh, how does a person know in his heart that Islam is the right religion? Well, I think first the person should be convinced that there is a right religion. That's what they need to be clear on because for a lot of people the issue of is there a right religion has to be clear. So once they've accepted that yes, there must be a right religion, that God in his wisdom didn't leave people on their own, that he did send messengers to guide them, then the simple way is to compare, to compare the religions, look at what is being taught, and then look at what is a true candidate for being the true religion. Then one turns to God and asks for God's guidance. And God will make it clear and plain for them. But it's true knowledge. What we don't want people to, to join religion on the basis of emotion. Where you're emotionally you know, caught up. But it should be based on knowledge. After knowledge, then you give your emotional commitment. So the advice would be to get all your questions answered, all the basic questions, uh, study some of the other religions so it doesn't mean, doesn't mean you don't come into the religion you didn't know about any other religions. So you have an idea and then when you're convinced in your heart, then inshallah, that's the time to make the move. Zakhalakha. Yeah. Is that, is that that it, Sheikh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to see if there are any non-Muslims present who would like yeah. to ask the question. To the yeah, that's that's a good point. Sorry, I mean I've been saying that throughout the last two days, but I forgot. Sheikh has reminded me if there are any not yet Muslims and they want to ask questions. If you feel shy, write them down. Write the question down. Believe me, and I, I mean I, I've I've listened to Abu Amina Bilal Phillips until I, well. Before I embraced Islam, I was reading his books and listening to his... They were tapes then. They weren't DVDs. <laughs> they were tapes, audio tapes. I used to put them in the car and listen on journeys. And I got knowledge from that. 
alhamdulillah. So those people who want to ask questions pertaining to, you know, any issue, non-Muslims, please do write your question down or come to the, um, you know, come to the uh, microphones. Do we have any question from sisters? There is a question. There's a question about, actually, which is pertaining to the topic. A lot of people are struggling with the concept of buying their own house and financing the purchase of their own house in Norway, particularly a lot of Muslims have mentioned that. And they were talking about the prohibition of riba, and they wanted you to explain, Sheikh, that um, is that I mean, what, is there any permissibility at all in buying a house, or you know, if you're here and you can't, maybe you've got nowhere to live. A lot of people they don't they don't have welfare state system with social housing here in Norway. More than half the salary goes to the half the salary goes to the rent. More than that, yeah, it's like London anyway. So they're asking for a bit of advice on that. Alhamdulillah, salatu was salam, Rasulullah. To deal with uh, issues of purchasing one's own home, what was done in Canada, uh, where I grew up, uh, was that uh, Muslims formed an association, a housing association, where the members of that association all contributed a certain amount monthly into a fund. And they then drew by straws who would get the first house. When the amount of money reached sufficient to get a house, then the person who was first in the list, they got the house. But the house remained in the name of the cooperative until everybody received their house. So what it's saying is that uh, this situation forced Muslims to come and to work together. You couldn't, the only way to do it on your own was to go to the bank and get the mortgage. And this was haram. So the alternative is that the Muslim community work together and develop the alternatives. And that is the proper way, as opposed to just saying, well, you know, I cannot afford it, so therefore I'm going to the bank. No. You sacrifice, even if it means half of your salary is going to rent, at the end of the year you don't have a place, but you have to know that if you're paying half of your salary in rent, that every kroner that you pay is blessed by Allah. That's what you have to be certain of. Because you're paying it to avoid going into riba, going into interest. So know that every kroner is blessed by Allah. Whereas if you do the mortgage, know that every kroner you pay is cursed by Allah. So though you may end up with a home, but it is a cursed home. As the Prophet Sallallahu had said about the man on the journey who dust in his hair, falls on his knees, raises his hands, prays to Allah. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, how is Allah going to answer his prayer when the food that he is eating is haram? The money that he has earned is haram. The flesh that has grown on his body has grown from haram. How is Allah going to answer his prayers? So that is the bottom line. We should know that. Even though that person was on a journey, and we know that's the best time to make dua. Isn't it? He raises his hands. That's one of the correct actions in making dua. But his dua was rejected because his food, his earnings were haram. So my advice, as I said, for the community to come together, create that association. We did it in Canada. You can do it here. But it requires effort, sacrifice, commitment. But it can be done.
Zakala Khair, just to let you know, also that's gone on in um, Leicester, in London, in, in, in England as well, whereby they've set up cooperatives. And there are many cooperatives actually all around the, uh, the Western sort of Europe area of uh, people buying houses and helping each other to obtain, like the Sheikh is saying. Um, we, have, we have one from the sisters and one from here. Who are we going to go to? Oh, yeah. Sister's chance. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, how, I got a question from uh, sister. She says, how can one person get better at controlling one's negative emotions when someone tries to be patient but has a problem being consistent in daily life? Any advice? Uh, in terms of controlling negative emotions uh, it can be it is countered by positive emotions that one has to develop uh, positive uh, outlooks and that's what we spoke about uh, where uh, positivism in Islam begins with gratitude and it is nurtured by patience so one has to do uh, good deeds, one has to be grateful whenever good deeds is done, and at the same time, one has to be patient and make patience a part of their day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle. When that happens, then the negative, uh, pessimistic uh, outlook will start to change. But one has to make that commitment and make those steps and ultimately, it has to be for the sake of God, for the sake of Allah, because that's what's going to keep them uh, committed and consistent. If one is doing it just for people, just to prove something to other people, then we'll not be able to maintain uh, gratitude and patience uh, throughout our lives. We'll always falter, we'll always end up falling apart because there are a million and one reasons why not to be grateful and why not to be patient. Um, there's another one which says uh, there are many people who say they love the teachings, they like the teachings of Islam Sheikh, and uh, if you ask them why they haven't become Muslims, they have no answer. Um, but they've heard They've heard about the, the teachings of Islam and they're just sort of waiting for a sign. Is there any advice that you would give to those people if they're in the room? Well, I would say that um, one needs to answer the question, why not? You know, one needs to address and to find out what is the reason why one is hesitating. I mean, usually it comes down to issues of family, what are people going to say, what are my friends going to say, that's the usual you know, factor which will hold certain people back. And we know that happened even in the time of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, where his own uncle Abu Talib didn't accept Islam for that same fear. That's what it means that it is, and it's something I've heard many, many times in many, many places. But for those of you in the audience who might have that uh, thought or have that uh, obstacle, then you have to reflect on the fact that we don't know when our time is going to come. We don't know when uh, we're going to die. If we have an awareness of the truth, then we need to commit ourselves to the truth, take it on, and know that God ultimately will provide, will protect, and will help us through the rest of our life. There are people uh, all through the centuries from the earliest of times who have made this choice and they have been successful in their lives. They've gone through difficulties, they have suffered, etc. But all of this is for the good if one is sincere it will serve to make one a stronger believer and ultimately 
when we stand before God on the day of judgment, he's not going to ask us about our family, our friends, our neighbors, etc. He's going to ask us about ourselves. Why we didn't make the choice when we could. Zakhalak Hershek, and the, another question from the sister or sisters. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have a friend that is not yet a Muslim and she wants to become a Muslim, but there's a lot of things she doesn't want to give up, like partying or yeah, um, alcohol, but she's not addicted, she just likes alcohol. <laughs> Okay. And she <clears throat> wants to become a Muslim, but she doesn't want to give up that part of her life. What should I tell her? Just the alcohol, is it? Or, and partying. partying. <laughs> okay. Well, I would say that um, I'm sure there's a lot of Muslims here who are partying. <laughs> you know? I won't ask you to put your hands up, <laughs> but I'm sure there are a lot who are partying. So um, she can come and become a Muslim and still party. <laughs> it's not to say that it's something that we're going to encourage her to keep on doing, but we believe that having become a Muslim and learned about the religion and started to practice it, then the need to party will get less and less until, inshallah, you give it up. And even in the case of alcohol, mm. some people might say, well, no. How are you going to let her take shahada and she's still drinking? Well, is it better for her to take shahada and still drink? Or is it better for her not to take shahada and still drink? Take shahada, obviously. So I would say if she wants to become a Muslim, let her become a Muslim. Let her know, of course, she knows that alcohol is forbidden. That she will have to deal with it. She has to go beyond it. But better for her to go ahead and become a Muslim than not. So I think that's very clear. Thank you. A brother's question, how is she going to make prayer if she's drunk? No, we don't, we don't, we're not going to. No, what, what did Allah say in the Quran? In other words, don't come to prayer, don't pray when you're intoxicated. So we tell her that simply, as Allah said, don't pray when you're intoxicated. No, I'm saying we understand this, brother. When I'm saying, you ask, how is she going to pray when she's intoxicated? We tell her, don't pray when you're intoxicated. That's it. That's the start, yes. She, she could be intoxicated with the worship of Allah. <laughs> Instead of the khamar. <laughs> inshallah. inshallah. We'll pray for her to reach that stage. Oh, inshallah. Inshallah, may Allah make it easy for her to take that decision and as soon as possible before she meets, meets Allah. Inshallah. Uh, then we've got another question. Quite a nice question. What does Islam say about love? Um, it's very vague. I think it means... I'm not sure. It probably means the love of Allah, is does it? Or love as in women and men loving each other? Well, maybe the person who asked the question should clarify. You should. What did it's you mean nice by that? question if we knew what it meant. Because <laughs> it's a big, big topic. Yeah. But uh, what we can just say in general that um, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, Sallam. you know, one is not a true believer unless one loves Allah and his messenger more than anyone or anything in this world. That the basis of our belief is love, love of God. That the love of God should be greater than the love of the material world and the things of this material world. Inshallah, inshallah. Zakhallah khair. And question about hijab, halal, haram, sunnah. It's a long one. <laughs> well, hijab is, is quite simple. Hijab is an obligation on Muslim women. And, uh, of course, it doesn't mean that if a Muslim woman doesn't wear hijab, she's no longer a Muslim. But she is in sin. From the perspective of God, she is in sin if she doesn't wear hijab. Hijab meaning that she covers her body the whole of her body in a loose garment from head to toe, uh, nothing being seen of her 
except her face and hands. And we should also know, because all the time we talk about hijab, we always speak about the hijab of women. But we should also know that there is hijab of men. The hijab of men, no, not just the, there's a mental hijab also, yes, we know about that hijab. But there's the other hijab, which is the external hijab, where it is prohibited for a Muslim man to wear pants which expose his private parts. Because at the same time we say, women, cover yourself. But then we're walking out with spandex pants. And men. So there's no double standard in Islam. As a woman, it is not acceptable hijab for her to wear something on her head, but she wears a top which is so tight, she may as well not be wearing any top. Or a bottom that is so tight, she may as well not be wearing any bottom. Mm. We don't accept that as hijab. It's not hijab. Similarly, for men, particularly between the navel and the knee, their garments should be so loose that private parts are not exposed. And this is a big issue because a lot of the Muslim community, the males in the Muslim community, have ignored this. And scholars will tell you, and you will know, that one of the uh, conditions for the uh, correctness or acceptability of salah is what? Satrul Aura, covering the private parts. So covering the private parts is no different for men than women in the sense that between the navel and knee, which is the private area of the male, that is supposed to be covered in a similar manner. The garment should be loose. So pants that are Western style pants for Muslims is really not acceptable. Unless you're wearing a top which comes down to your knee or you're wearing loose pants like the shalwar Pakistani <laughs> pants. The waist is like this wide, you know, it comes together. Whatever. This is a point that you need to address. Because if you are serious about the deen, then we don't have a double standard. One standard of exposing aura or covering aura for men and another standard for women. No. We have one standard in Islam. Zakhala khair, Shaykh Tana Phillips, alhamdulillah. Well, unfortunately, that comes really drawing to us a, to a close for the second day because we have to be out of the building pretty soon. Ooh.